Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our virtual event, Italy, a cultural journey. My name is Rachel Taylor, and I'm a programming librarian here at the Scranton Memorial Library. Tonight, we are very pleased and excited to welcome as our guest speaker, Ashley Turney, the founder of the La Sperta Travel Company in New London, and a travel designer, writer, and all-around Italy expert. Through her talk this evening, we will explore the regional differences of Italy with a photographic presentation which will take us on a colorful journey from north to south and even to the islands of Sardinia and Sicily. I do ask that everyone please remain muted until the end of the talk. If you have a question before then, you are more than welcome to enter it into the group chat and Ashley will address it when she is able. This program is presented through the generosity of an anonymous donor in honor of parents Dom Domenico and Melina Pelicano both originally from the southeastern region of Italy. Thank you so much to Ashley for being with us tonight. And without further ado, here is Italy, a cultural journey. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, buonasera to you all. And um, thank you so much for coming. Let me just get my, um, get my presentation set up here for a second and Let's see. Okay, there we go. So um, I, I wanted to thank the library and thank Rachel and uh, that generous donor for welcoming me tonight. I know we were all hoping that this could be live, but um, the benefits of being here um, in, in your homes is you can wear your fuzzy slippers and I hope you all have a nice glass of wine, Italian preferably, sitting with you and you can kick back and enjoy. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Ashley Turney. I am um, a absolute 100% Italophile, lover of all things Italian. And my love affair with Italy began in uh, 1990 when as a freshman at Trinity College, I um, was sitting in the library on campus and I saw a flyer that said, um, spend the summer in Italy. And I thought, wow, that sounds really great. So um, off I went. I did not speak a word of the language. Um, I um, had never taken public transportation in my life. And I went for a summer. I got to the airport in, in Rome and I uh, handed the taxi driver a piece of paper with the name of my hotel on it. And um, and was dropped in the middle of Rome, a city of 4 million people. And I fell completely and utterly in love. Um, and from that time, I continued um, to pursue my love of Italy through uh, studying the language. I went back to Florence um, my junior year and lived for seven months in Florence, um, both in school and then working as an English tutor for an Italian family. Um, the kids, were preparing for their exams, but all they really wanted me to do was translate Queen songs for them. Um, and were extremely disappointed when they found out that another what another one bites the dust means in English. Uh, the, the young girl said, I always thought it was such a beautiful song <laughs> until I told her what it meant. Um, but uh, so uh, I was there for seven months. And then after I graduated from Trinity, I went back and lived in Rome for five years. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty partial to Rome, but um, I grew to realize as when I returned to Italy again and again, that there wasn't just one Italy and there were dozens and everywhere I went was like being in a whole nother world. So I've continued to go back for the past 30 plus years um, and it, it's really become part of my life. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to Italy before. Um, if you haven't, um, it's certainly, I hope that this uh, slideshow will give you a little taste of what there is to see and do and will whet your appetite. And if you've been there, I'm sure you could uh, easily um, plan a trip back with no problem. Um, I think right now, um, all of us could use nothing more than a trip to Italy. And since we are not really ready to go there, actually we'll go there virtually tonight. And so, um, these are just some images um, for you to enjoy as I tell you a little bit of my observations of what life is like in Italy and um, what made me fall in love with it and, and continue to be in love with it all these years later. Um, 
one thing many of you might not realize is that Italy is um, a pretty young nation. Um, it is actually about 100 years younger than the United States of America. And um, it was actually unified, though it has a very long, the peninsula itself has a very long history, um, you know, going back millennia. The country of Italy is actually uh, only, uh, was only unified in 1861. And so, um, because of that, Italy has a very um, a varied history throughout its throughout its country. So um, there are it was um, kind of conquered by a lot of different people. Of course, the Romans were there, but also the Greeks and the Spaniards and the French and um, the Arabs in, in, um, in Sicily. And so they have a kind of a, when we talk about a cultural journey and a mosaic of cultures, Italy is just that. And all of these people who have come through Italy, um, you know, through the centuries have left their imprint and in each place, in each region or each city, each area of the country, um, we find that things are a little different because of um, their history and also because of their geography. Um, it's an easy place, I think, for Americans to go. It's, it seems pretty comfortable. Um, but when we think of Italy in, in the collective we, and we think of it as a homogeneous place, we may be surprised to learn that there are a lot of differences within the country. Um, and the reason is that there are hundreds of Italy's really. Um, the it is made up of 20 regions and, and they're so different that no matter where you visit or how many times you visit, there are always different things to see. I mean, you look at the, the picture here, the Alto Adige looks much more like a Swiss village. Um, and it's not what we think of when we think of under the Tuscan sun. Um, we have a very different look there. Um, and the differences do begin with the topography itself. The country is about the size of Georgia and Florida put together, and it has a spine that runs right down the middle, that is the Apennine Mountains. And so that divides geographically, dry, divides the country north to uh, east to west. And obviously it's a very significant division, but the, the more significant division is between the north and the south. And although there's not a physical barrier between the southern and northern regions, the divide is palpable um, because of kind of the prejudices and the ideas of, of the south, the negative connotations a lot of times um, in Italy between the north and south um, for many reasons that, um, that, that have gone back in history for, for centuries and centuries. But because of the negative associations, no one really wants to be from the South. So where Southern Italy starts really depends on who you talk to. So if you are in Florence, everything South of Florence is in the South. But if you're in Rome, everything South of Rome is considered the South. So um, it's, it's an interesting um, and political uh, division that um, could be a whole lecture in and of itself. But the bottom line is that um, the, the northern part of Italy does not consider itself to be a part of, of the southern part of Italy. They don't feel very unified. Um, the north, if you took the part of Italy from basically Bologna north, um, and, and that became one country leaving off the southern part of Italy, um, that part, that country would be the wealthiest country in Europe. Whereas um, adding in the south, um, there's a lot of unemployment. There's a lot of poverty. Um, unemployment in, in Southern Italy can be as much as high as 30% in parts of Sicily. Um, and so the, the Northern regions feel like the South drags them down a little bit. Um, and it's an unfortunate situation, um, but it is um, very, uh, very present and a very uh, difficult part of um, kind of life in Italy. But, you know, aside from the North-South division, if you ask an Italian where they're from, um, they'll never say, they will very rarely say they're from Italy, but rather they'll say, I'm Roman, I'm Florentine, I'm Sicilian. 
Um, there's strong historical reasons for this. Um, and most of it is because they have not been the ed part of a nation for so long and that their cultures and their histories are so steeped in other cultures and other places. Um, in, in fact, um, Prince von Metternich referred to Italy as nothing more than a geographic expression in the 19th, in the 19th century um, and when unification occurred. Um, at the time, for the bid for unification, it was largely a rural and agricultural society and almost feudal, in fact. Um, there's an area in the heart of Rome that even at the turn of the 20th century, one could hear the ringing of sheep's bells and see shepherds herding flocks. I mean, that's in a city, a metropolitan city. When you think of Rome, you would never think of it as having fields of, uh, of sheep grazing, but that in fact is what happened. Um, only about 8% of the population of the territories that made up Italy at the time of unification were literate. And only those who were literate were able to, um, to vote. And so therefore uh, the vote for unification was not something that was really popular necessarily, it just happened. It was an idea of the elite and it, it, it took off. Um, and because the common people had become quite accustomed to being lorded over by other people from Greeks to Arabs to Spaniards to French, they didn't really, they didn't think of it one way or another when Italy was finally unified. Um, in Naples, for example, there is uh, where there was a lot of foreign occupation. There's a saying that says, o Franco Spagna porque si mania, which means who cares if it's French or Spain as long as we eat. I mean, their, their concerns were much more realistic and, and less idealistic and kind of um, worrying about survival in everyday life. Um, and so once they were uh, unified, Italy was unified, um, the, uh, they said, we've made Italy, now we must make the Italians. And this obviously, as I've mentioned, has proved much more difficult um, than anyone thought. There is really no true sense of patriotism in Italy. Um, you'll very rarely see an um, Italian flag flying over uh, someone's house. The only time you see Italian flags hanging outside of houses is when the, the national soccer team is playing in the World Cup. Then they become very patriotic. But other than that, um, they are much more tied to um, the place where they live. Um, and, and not only uh, the region, maybe the city, and maybe even the neighborhood. And a perfect example of this is, um, it's actually called campanilismo. It means loyalty to one's bell tower. And campanilismo, rather than patriotism, um, is the idea that all that really matters is what you can see from your bell tower. And that's the bell tower of your town or the bell tower of your neighborhood. Um, and this is something that really comes to life when you go to Siena and you see Siena um, and, and something very important to the Sienese people is uh, the palio. Um, which is the horse race that takes place every year um, in the summertime on the 2nd of July. And it, it, it is a, a, a horse race between the 17 neighborhoods of the city. Um, and, and Siena is divided into 17 neighborhoods, which are all, they each have their own chapel, church. They each have their own um, um, fountain, like public fountain, where they would, where the people in medieval times would go and get their water. But now it's kind of a gathering place. It's at a very important place for uh, the Sienese people. And when you are born into a contrada, which is the neighborhood, you're born into a contrada and you are baptized both in the church and at the public fountain. And you were baptized there at the public fountain and you're presented with uh, a scarf that has the symbols and the colors of your particular neighborhood. And the neighborhoods have different names. There's the neighborhood of the goose, the neighborhood of the owl, the neighborhood of the, of the porcupine there. And there's 17 different neighborhoods. I mean, this is a city of 50,000 people and it's divided into 17 parts. 
and the Sienese people do not um, take lightly to intermingling between one, one another, let alone people from other parts of Italy. Um, in Siena, in, in these neighborhoods, we went one time with a group of people to, and had a tour of the neighborhood of the Owl. And we went to, um, they had their chapel and they had their museum and their museum is dedicated to um, their victories in this horse race. And we went through, and when we went to the chapel, this young girl who was showing us around, she was a college student and I was translating for her. And we went into the museum or to the chapel and on either side of the chapel, the altar was, were flags of um, the owl contrada flying. And she said, when you get married, your flag from your family it flies on each side, one side for the bride and one side for the groom, the family flag flies there when you get married. And I said, oh, so if you married someone from the goose contrada, you would have a goose on one side and an owl on the other side. And she looked at me and she said, nobody from the owl contrada would ever marry anyone from the goose contrada. <laughs> and, so, and they're very, I mean, it seems like a very antiquated, um, uh tradition but it still rings true and they're they find it very important and so every year um this is the main campo the piazza del campo and the town hall is um in this in this lower area and what happens is they put down dirt in the middle of the in this whole arena in this whole piazza um on the second of july or they start a little earlier and they um, and they run the horse race and it's three times around the uh, piazza and the winner is uh, is deemed the, the winner for the year and it comes with great celebration before the actual um, horse race. They bring the horse into the church of the Contrada and they bless the horse. Um, afterwards, the winning Contrada has a big, huge banquet feast and they um and they bring the horse the horse comes to the feast stands behind the people it's a big it's a big deal so here they are this is all in um medieval costume these are the people gathered in the middle and then all around the um uh, the windows, there are people sitting in the windows. This has become something uh, of a tourist attraction, but the Sienese people are not really interested in um, other people coming to this. This is for them, in their opinion, and it is a representation of their loyalty and their pride in their neighborhoods. Um, and so they, they do this for and it goes on the celebration the preparation goes on for days before and then um and then it it culminates in the race itself these are just some details of the costumes um that they wear um the the jockeys are actually not from the area but they are um mostly sardinian because the sardinians are known for being great equestrians and um, and they, they really, um, this really is the centerpiece of their whole year. There is a fantastic uh, book, if you're interested in reading about this, this one event that happens every year, and it's happened every year, to the extent that the Pope wanted to come to Siena one year on July 2nd, and they said, and he, they, the papacy sent information and a request, and they said, well, we actually cannot welcome you that day because we have the polio. You're more than welcome to come the next day. And that's what, ha what happened. Um, I think once in World War, during World War II, the polio did not happen. But other than that, it's taken place for about 600 years um, continuously. And uh, it's, it's quite an experience. But the book is called La Terra in Piazza. La Terra, T-E-R-R-A, in Piazza. Um, the the title was not translated, but the book has been translated to, into English, and it's a really fascinating look at this uh, this whole event and what goes on, um, the bribes that take place, the the scandals that take place uh, surrounding it. And it goes on all year long, and so this is just to me like a perfect example of um, how important 
um, and loyal the Italians are to their their place, um, and much less so to uh, to Italy than they are to the place where they come from, the actual town or the neighborhood they come from. Um, so uh, it, these are the obviously the horse is going around. The horse can finish and win without the jockey. So if the jockey falls off and the horse crosses the finish line first, that contrada still wins. Um, and I just find it, it's such a fascinating uh, look at Italian life. Um, it can get pretty violent um, and there, you know, they kind of hit each other, uh, try to knock each other off their horses and everything, but uh, it, it's quite an event. 90 seconds of pure excitement and adrenaline. Um, so, you know, these, these Italians, when, when you talk to them and, and you talk about how they don't have this feeling of patriotism, I mean, you even look at their language and the fact that there are dozens and dozens of dialects in Italy. Um, I am fluent in Italian, but if I go to Venice and I listen to the gondoliers speaking in the Venetian dialect, I cannot understand them. Um, not even, you know, I can get by, I can't, I can't understand what they're saying because it's so drastically different. And in fact, um, many of the dialects in Italy have been looked at by linguists and have been determined to be not just dialects, but actual different languages because they vary so much from, uh, from the Italian language. So it's interesting. And, and you look in Sicily and Sicily has words um, in their dialect that come directly from Arab, Arabic. Um, they have words that in, in, um, in the Neapolitan dialect that come from French. And uh, so you can understand that, you know, only being a couple hundred years old, not even um, the impact of their history has been much longer, uh, has been much more profound than, um, than the, the hundred years that they do, that they have been unified, the 150 years that they have been unified. So, um, but despite the differences, there are certain things um, to me that are common throughout Italy and that make Italy um, that you will find a, a common thread wherever you go. And um, those to me are, are the food, the beauty of Italy and the people. Um, and when it comes to Italy, obviously we think of food, we think of food and wine um, and, and how wonderful it is. And I, um, as a, a non-Italian and a very non-Italian looking uh, person who was fluent in, in, in Italian, I had the great pleasure of being able to eavesdrop. And I would eavesdrop a lot when I was walking around town, um, when I was on the bus, um, wherever I was. And I can tell you that um, probably 90% of the time when you listen to eavesdrop on an Italian, they're talking about food. Um, and never have you heard Italians speak so with such passion and enthusiasm as when you bring up food. Um, you know, they talk about either what they did eat, what they will be eating. Um, it will be described in impeccable detail um, and will include information on where the ingredients are from, um, how the meal was, a, uh, was prepared, the, the wine that went with it. And um, it's just a real passion of theirs. And it's not only because of the food, but it's because of what that food brings about. And that means bringing about like sitting together around the table with friends and family. Um, but one thing you will never find um, is Italians eating food out of season. Italians um, embrace the um, kind of, local and um, seasonal food movement long before we did here in Italy, in America. Um, it's just what you do. And so um, when you go to Italy in, um, say in June, you would never be able to find an artichoke on the menu. But if you go in December, January, you will see artichokes in every possible form. And you, if you are down south in Italy, you'll see trucks with the backs overflowing with artichokes making their way up north uh, to be delivered. Um, and, you know, there's something really wonderful about eating seasonally. 
Um, it's there, not only is it the freshest and the most delicious, but there's also a sense of anticipation because you know that you are not going to have that thing for a, a, for the whole year. And so you enjoy it when it comes. And, you know, when you go into Rome in November and the smell of chestnuts and you know that it's time for chestnuts, um, there really is something fantastic about that. Um, and, um, while I'm not a huge fan of the mo the book Under the Tuscan Sun for my own reasons, um, Francis May's discussion of this aspect of, of um, Italian society is, is totally accurate. And she says, you know, Italians eat grapes in the fall, uh, melon and watermelon in the summer, chestnuts and truffles in the winter, fava beans, peas, artichokes in the spring. Um, and it's so ingrained in their minds um, that it's really, um, it's just kind of the rhythm of the year and what to expect. And actually, I would remember being at um, d d Market in Hartford uh, a few years ago, and I went to... Um, I, they had fava beans in, in, and in May, on May 1st, which is May Day, it's a holiday in Italy, um, you always have fava beans and pecorino cheese, and it's a big thing that, that Italians always look forward to. And so they had fava beans, and I went to the counter, and I asked the woman for pecorino cheese, and she said, well, what are you doing with it? I said, I'm going to eat it with fava beans. And she knew immediately that I must have lived in Italy or been Italian because she started speaking to me in Italian immediately because it is such a, a part of uh, Italian culture and society. Um, and so um, I love that whole tradition of um, eating seasonally and not only eating seasonally, but eating locally. Um, there are um, recipes that are, all, and we all have local recipes, wherever we go, you're going to eat something that's local and, and it's always best to eat something local. But um, the Italian local foods are really um, have a strong tradition tied to their, to their history. Um, for example, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Tuscany, but if you have, and you've had their bread, um, you might have noticed that it is not fantastic. Um, and the reason is that they don't put salt in their bread. Um, and this come, goes back to um, when Tuscany and Umbria were part of the Papal States. The papacy decided a great way to um, make some more money was to put a tax on salt. And they thought, well, they, they have to have salt. They have to put salt in their bread. Um, it's, it's an imperative thing, uh, ingredient. And the Tuscans and the Umbrians being who they were, they just said, eh, we'll just stop putting salt in our bread. Now, this was about 500 years ago that they decided not to put salt in their bread anymore. And they still don't put salt in their bread. So when you go, you, you have bread that's plain and it doesn't taste very good. But as a result, all sorts of uh, recipes and um, dishes have come about that enhance that bread um, with crostini, with the fresh olive oil, with Papa al Pomodoro or Ribolita, these bread soups that are made with the bread that does not have salt in it. So they need ways to enhance the flavor. Um, so there are um, many dishes all around Italy where you, you're going to eat. If you're looking here at the, you know, the Alpine mountains and everything up in the north, there are their traditional dishes. They never, they never hardly ever use tomatoes in their dishes up north. They use um, much heavier, they use heavy cream, they use butter, they, use, they have a dish called pizzocchi, which is a buckwheat noodle with butter and cheese and onions and potatoes. And it's extremely heavy, but it's also extremely delicious. And what it's meant for is for those cold winter days like today, um, kind of stick to your ribs for um, the shepherds and everything that are going to go back out into the mountains. So they'll have a big bowl of pizzoccheri and then they'll follow that up with a uh, cafe corretto, which is an espresso. Um, corret, cafe corretto is corrected coffee. 
And so it's an espresso with a shot of grappa in it. Um, and that will just warm them from the inside and they will go back on their way. So everything is kind of geared um, to the climate of the region, to the geography, to the history. Um, if you go to the city of Lucca, um, you will see in every restaurant, you'll see a zuppa con faro, a zuppa di faro, and that's a faro soup, a spelt soup. And those, um, that soup, you'll find everywhere in Lucca and then you go 30 miles outside of Lucca and you won't see it at all. And it's really, really great to kind of be able to embrace those um, local dishes and experience them in different ways and, um, and be able to, to kind of get to know the region or the city or the town through its cuisine. Um, one of the greatest differences that exists from region to region is culinary today. Um, much of the traditions have long historic reasons. Um, the Roman cuisine, for example, is largely based on innards of various animals. And the reason for that is that the, um, the papacy would always, when they did the butchers, the, the, the butchers would cut the meats, the best meat would go to the actual, to the papacy and to the wealthy people. And whatever was left was left for the more common folk. And, and the slaughterhouses were filled with these innards and everything that would then be sold to common, the common people. And the Romans made the most of this and they made it into some of their most traditional dishes that still exist today. One of them is a, a dish called payata, rigatoni a payata, which is rigatoni with sheep's intestine. Um, and in the area of the slaughterhouses in Rome in a, in a, a neighborhood called Testaccio, you'll find some of the best, um, most traditional cuisine um, of Rome and it will be part, primarily, the dishes will be primarily based um, with innards of some sort. Um, it's not for everyone, obviously, but um, for those who love it, it is uh, unbeatable, really. Um, so I think that, you know, the, um, the, the cuisines in these places, you know, you go to Italy and you don't think of um, fancy cuisine. You know, French cuisine is very high, very elevated. Italian cuisine is extremely simple. Um, it's it's cucina povera, which is a poor man's cooking. Um, they use very little, in fact, very little um, meat. There aren't big, you know, there aren't, there's not a lot of grazing area for cows and that type of thing. Um, it's a very mountainous country. And so there isn't a lot of room for that. And therefore um, they have a lot of um, sheep, you know, sheep and goats um, primarily as far as uh, meat goes. And um, they use a lot of greens, a lot of vegetables, a lot of beans, lentils, that type of thing. Um, and I was told one time that uh, a good Tuscan dish should contain more, no more than four ingredients. And the um, and if you're going to only use four ingredients for something, the quality has to be of the highest quality. And that's the other thing that Italians really pride themselves on. They have the highest quality. They use the highest quality everything: the olive oil, um, the the even the vegetables, you know, when they are fresh and seasonal, they're going to be of the highest quality and the flavor is going to be at its peak. And that's extremely important to Italians. Um, they also really, when you say they live for the seasons, um, they're very intuitive and they just know uh, when things are ready and they're patient and they don't, they don't force things. I was at a vineyard in, um, in Tuscany a, a several years ago and we went for a tour of the vineyard and a tasting and I walked it was the end of September and I met up with the owner and I said oh I said how are you he said oh we're great it's it's harvest time I said oh it's the 28th of September it's harvest time now he said I said is that when you always start he said no I said well when do you start he said when the winemaker goes out to the field and eats a grape and he says it's time that's when we start pressing the grapes and to me, that is just so fantastic. Um, and the patience that it takes to kind of just embrace that um, is really wonderful. 
Um, they also have these wonderful um, traditions around um, the harvest, um, the olives, for example, in Umbria and Tuscany. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen olives being harvested and in Italy, they're grown in such a way that they cannot be harvested um, by machines. It all has to be by hand. And so they climb up the trees. They put a big tarp around the bottom, the base of the tree, and they climb up with these large combs and they scrape down all the olives, the leaves and, and you know, stems and, and everything all come down, some of the branches, but the olives go into this big uh, tarp and they bring the tarp then to the olive mills. And because olives have only um, 48 hours to be off the tree before they turn rancid, they have to keep moving with the olive oil and the, uh, with the olive pressing. So the olive mills are open 24 hours a day um, throughout the harvest season, which usually takes place end of October through um, the middle of November, depending on where you are in, in Italy and what olive oil, um, what, what region you're in and the, and the climate and everything, but usually around the beginning of November. And so they, they have these um, olive mills open 24 hours a day. There's always a kitchen in the olive mill and you bring your olives and while the olives are pressing, it's a social event. And there are other farmers there who are having their olives pressed and they sit together and they have a meal while they wait. And then as payment to the olive mill, you leave a portion of your olive oil at the olive mill. And then the olive mill will sell a, what's considered a co-op of, um, of olive oil. So it comes from all of the different producers um, who press their oil there and then they'll sell that. And that's kind of how they make their money from the pressing. And it's just fascinating. And, and, um, and it's a really neat kind of um, community experience. And if you're ever there for the olive, um, for the olive harvest, it's great to go to one of these olive mills and see this all taking place. Um, obviously, aside from the food, which, you know, we, again, that could take a whole nother, uh, a whole uh, lecture in and of itself. But aside from the food, um, the beauty of Italy is really just unsurpassed. And that's um, physical beauty. I mean, the, the country, as you've seen through these pictures, I mean, the countryside is beautiful. The mountains are beautiful. Um, the, um, uh, the, the architecture is magnificent and the artwork. And I think that Italians have a really keen sense of aesthetic um, because they have been surrounded. I, I always think about this and I think they've been surrounded by beauty their whole lives, um, immersed in it. I mean, they've got, you know, the masterpieces of, of Michelangelo, of Raphael, of, uh, uh, you know, of Vivaldi. I mean, if you're talking even music, there's just beauty surrounding Italians all the time. And I think it just kind of is part of them. And as a result, they have this sense of, of style um, and aesthetic that they carry through in their lives. I mean, if any of you have been to Italy and you see the way Italian men and women dress, absolutely impeccable. Um, and they are very, um, they really are all about kind of appearances and, and putting their best foot forward all the time. And in Italian, it's called um, una bella figura. Fare una bella figura is to, um, make a good, cut a good figure is what it means. Um, but it really means kind of making yourself look good all, all the time. And, you know, they would never run out to grab a coffee in like sweatpants and a, and a t-shirt, you know, you get dressed. Um, women still to this day go to the hairdresser every week and have their hair set, even young women. Um, they do, um, in Italian, very popular um, tradition, especially in the little villages, but even in the larger cities, is the passeggiata, which is the afternoon promenade. Um, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon, you will see um, everyone coming out from, you know, um, little babies to um, grandparents and everything. And they just stroll up and down the streets and they put on their best. You see these little babies in Burberry jackets and, you know, dressed to the nines and they just walk up and down the street. They have a gelato. They see, um, 
they see each other in the street and they, you know, it's their social hour. And Italy is primarily based outside. I mean, the weather is pretty favorable in, in most places um, for most of the year. And so they are able to be outside and that's where their socializing takes place. Um, it's also where um, they, they do feel like they have to look, um, look the part all the time. Um, and I, they, uh, they carry that aesthetic through everything, through the way they dress, through um, the, 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 the way they even um, decorate their, their storefronts, their windows. Um, when you go into the, to even a, a little pharmacy or a little hardware store, they have their windows decorated um, for the different seasons and, and they all look beautiful and they're well-placed and, and, and refined. Um, if you go in and you buy a little gift for someone, they always ask, do you want me to wrap this for you? And when they do, I mean, you could buy a five-year-old little, little souvenir and it looks like, you know, you've just bought something at a designer shop because it's so beautiful and they take such attention to detail. Um, and it's really, really fantastic. These photos that you're seeing now are just some of the, the people I've met along the way. Um, and I do think the Italians are some of the most amazing people you will meet. Um, they are um, warm, they are um, friendly and fantastic. The problem is um, in Italy, they don't always um, follow the rules. Um, they are, um, rules, I guess, are considered suggestions in Italy is what I would say. And if you, if we were all together and we were, um, we were in person, I would tell you that there's no such thing as personal space. So I don't know how this COVID thing is working out for them because, uh, their idea of six feet is about six inches. Um, and that is almost too much space. So anywhere you go, um, you like if you are, are looking for your personal space you're not going to have it and I remember when I first got to Italy as a very um kind of Anglo-Saxon girl and and it was very difficult to get used to this idea of not having any personal space um and you'd be at the grocery store and they're just they don't wait in lines you'd be at the bank and you're doing your transaction at the bank and there's someone talking over your shoulder to the teller um it does take some getting used to um, and, you know, the rules are that there are no rules. And so when you do live there for any extent of time, you decide that if you can't beat them, you join them. And so I, um, as a young 22 year old, uh, I was a, a group leader for elder hostel programs in Italy. And I was, we were in Rome and I had a group there and I was taking them along to, um, to Piazza Navona, I was trying to get them to learn the bus system and so that they could be independent and go off on their own. So I told them beforehand, I prepared them and I said, look, in Rome, here's how it works. When you get on the bus, you get your ticket ahead of time and you get on the back of the bus or the front of the bus. And then, um, and when you get off, you get off in the middle of the bus. Uh, there's a big double door in the middle and that's where you get off. I said, but because there's about 30 of us together tonight, we're going to just, they're going to, I'm sure the bus driver will see us, we'll open all the doors and we'll let us on all together. So just get on any, any door that opens as quickly as you can. So I explained all this and we go down to the bus stop and um, the bus pulls up and I tell them, this is our bus. This is the bus we're getting on. The bus pulls up and everyone kind of moves towards the bus and the bus driver only opens the front and the back door and not the middle doors. So now I have about 20 senior citizens who are totally panicked that they're not gonna get on this bus and they're banging on the door. So I run up to the front of the bus and I said to the bus driver, um, sir, you know, do you think you could open the middle doors? And he said, you live here, right? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, he said, then you should know that you're supposed to get on the front and, the, and, and back doors. I said, yes, I know, but I've got a lot of people. I just thought you could, you know, you could help me out here. And he took a deep breath and he said, oh, he said, that's what's wrong with this country. He said, people get on where they're supposed to get off. 
and they get off where they're supposed to get on. And because of this, I have a bad liver. Now I have no idea. <laughs> I do know that Italians are very obsessed with their livers and there are, are, are problems that are always getting their livers analyzed. I have friends who, no matter what, if they're not feeling well, they're going to have their liver analyzed. I've never heard an American getting their liver analyzed just for fun, but Italians do. And this poor uh, bus driver was very stressed out about the non-following of rules, which I thought was just part of being in Italy. Um, so we get on the bus, eventually everyone gets on the bus and we're driving, we're riding to Piazza Navona and I'm chatting with the bus driver. And when we're pulling up to Piazza Navona, I said, don't worry, I'll make sure everyone gets off at the middle bus in the middle doors. I don't want to upset you. And he's like, oh no, he's like, I like you. He's like, I'll open the door, all the doors for everyone. I'm like, I said, okay. So <laughs> I learned very quickly that there, you know, the rule is there are no rules, um, and Italians kind of uh, do their own thing, and um, but they always do it with a great zest for life and uh, and with with great happiness. Um, I think you find if you've been there, um, Italians really do try to be helpful. Um, they try to give directions even if they don't know where you're going, uh, which can be complicated. Um, they're also known for being um, what is called furbo or um, crafty, I guess. And that uh, the idea of being crafty in, in Italy is very um, revered. Um, it's considered a compliment if you're crafty. Um, and nowhere are they more crafty than in the city of Naples, um, where they take it to a whole nother level. Um, in fact, um, about 20 years ago, when uh, the um, seatbelt rule came into effect. The Italian seatbelt law, they, you know, first for a while didn't even have seatbelts in the car, car, some of the cars, the older cars didn't even have seatbelts. Um, then they all have seatbelts, but it wasn't required. And then it was finally mandated that you had to wear a seatbelt. But as in um, with any law in Italy, um, they kind of enforced the law very strictly for the beginning of it and then not at all. So, um, you know, for, you know, a couple of weeks, they had people standing, uh, police officers standing um, on the side of the road, looking to make sure that people had their seatbelts on. And um, there are some gentlemen, very entrepreneurial spirits in, in Naples, where they're very furbo, very crafty, decided that they would uh, take advantage of this situation. And so they made white t-shirts that had a black band that went from the left shoulder to the right hip. And they sold these and you would see a Neapolitan businessmen and, um, and women who would buy these t-shirts and they would put them on over their Armani suits and so that it looked like they were wearing a seatbelt so that when people went, when they went by the checkpoints, you would see this black band and they would think you were wearing your seatbelt and you didn't actually have to put it on. So um, they made a great deal of money and made quite a, um, uh, became quite famous in Italy for their entrepreneurial spirit and, and people uh, did not admonish them as much as they thought it was brilliant and wished they had thought of it themselves. Um, so um, I, I, you know, I just, I, I think about Italy all the time. I think about uh, what I love about it um, and what keeps me going back. And I really think it comes down to um, the, the fact that you don't know around any corner what you're going to see, what you're going to experience. Um, I, I wait for the, the next view, the next vista, the next panorama that's going to take my breath away um, to the, the next thing of beauty or the most exquisite dish that I've ever had. Um, and it seems like every time I go, I'm not disappointed and it just makes you want to return over and over again. So I thank you for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have um, about Italy, about travel to Italy, about particular regions or anything, but thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now so that we can um, have a Q&A session and everyone, thank you for watching. <laughs>